children are not merely our future, they are our present. And we need to celebrate and give our children and youth opportunities to serve the Lord. Our text this morning is Genesis chapter 18. Uh, But before we dive in, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, as we come before your throne of grace, we are grateful for your word, grateful for this church, this opportunity to gather and to worship you, Lord. Lord, I pray that it is well with our soul. Lord, we understand that we need you every hour we need you. Lord, especially this hour as we turn to your word. And God, you say, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says. So Lord, I pray that you will give us ears to hear and hearts open to receive your word. Holy Spirit, work in our hearts even now transform us, conform us into the image of your Son, Jesus Christ. And Lord, if there's one here who is lost, I pray this morning they will be found in Christ. I praise you, Lord. I pray that that Christ will increase, that I will decrease. Lord, forgive me my many sins. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. General William Booth, he was the founder of the Salvation Army, and he had lost his eyesight. His son was named Bramwell, and he was given the difficult task to tell his father there would be no more recovery for his eyesight. He says, do you mean that I am blind, the general asked. I hear we just must contemplate it, his son said. The father continued, I shall never see your face again? No, probably not. Not in this world, said Bramwell. But General Booth, he says, I've done what I could for God and for his people with my eyes. Now I shall do what I can for God without my eyes. What a great example for us. The founder of the Salvation Army, uh, an example of faith in God in sickness and in health. Eyesight, no eyesight. He was committed to serving the Lord. And uh, the title of this message this morning is A Faithful Servant. As we continue our study in the book of Genesis, Uh, we will look at Abraham, who is an example of a faithful servant for us. Abraham, he's had highs and lows, has he not? Highs of great faith and, and bouts of weak faith. When he went to Egypt, did he not lie about his wife, saying she was his sister? He messed up when he came with Hagar and Ishmael. But where we left off last Sunday in chapter 17, God once again reminded Abraham of his covenant with him, an eternal covenant. And God told Abraham to do something amazing. He told him to be circumcised with all the males of his household. And at 99 years old, Abraham did what the Lord said. I don't think I need to say much more about that. But Abraham did it because he was a man of faith in the one true and living God. And as we arrive here in chapter 18, we have this interesting encounter between Abraham and three men. But I I want us to see in our text is, Abraham's example of being a faithful servant. In verse 1, the first principle I want us to draw your attention to is that a faithful servant 
is one who practices friendliness. Verse 1, And the Lord appeared to him by the oaks of Mamre as he sat at the door of his tent in the heat of the day. He lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, three men were standing in front of him. And when he saw them, he ran from the tent door to meet them and bowed himself to the earth and said, O Lord, if I have found favor in your sight, do not pass by your servant. Let a little water be brought and wash your feet and rest yourselves under the tree. While I bring a morsel of bread that you may refresh yourselves, and after that you may pass on, since you have come to your servant. So they said, Do as you have said. And Abraham went quickly into the tent to Sarah and said, Quick, three seahs of fine flour, knead it, and make cakes. And Abraham ran to the herd and took a calf, tender and good, and gave it to a young man who prepared it quickly. Then he took curds and, uh, um, and milk in the calf that he had prepared and set it before them, and he stood by, stood by them under the tree as they ate together. So the story goes that Abram is at home in his tent in the heat of the day. We know about heat here in Louisiana, but heat here in Louisiana is much different than heat in Iraq and Kuwait, and the Middle East. Here it is humid. Here it can be 90 degrees outside, and you're miserable. And there you can be outside in a, a crisp 120 and do what you need to do. But here's Abraham sitting at the door of his tent, probably trying to catch a breeze from the heat of the day. And if you'll notice in verse 1, it says, The Lord appeared to Abraham. And he looks up, and it says, three men were standing there. Now, if you'll notice, the word Lord there is all capitalized, L-O-R-D. If you look a little further down in verse 3, you see the, the same word, the, the word Lord is spelled a little different. Capital L, lowercase O-R-D. So in verse 1, we have the, the name for God, Yahweh, and in verse 3, we have another name for God, Adonai. So what we have here is God, Yahweh, and we, we call that word, Bible scholars say that's the tetragrammaton, Yahweh. Y-H-W-H, because in the original Hebrew, there were no vowels. No A-E-I-O-U and sometimes Y. They didn't have that, although they added it later on. But this word, Yahweh, is the same word God told Moses his name was. And this word originates or is connected with the verb to be. God is, I am, I am, who says, I am. And this great, I am, appears to Abraham. But then he looks up and there are three, so... We have this God, this theophany, that is the manifestation of God, or Christophany, uh, the pre-incarnate Jesus Christ of the Old Testament, and two other men, likely angels. They appear to Abraham in the heat of the day. And chapter 18 tells us this amazing thing, that God reveals himself to Abraham. But notice with me how Abraham responds to God's presence. He ran to the Lord. He fell on his face. He said, Lord, if it's if I found favor, and, and what is unmerited favor? Grace, right? And God has graced him with his presence. And he says, Lord, do not pass me my, because uh, that's, that's what the Lord wanted to say that. That's a big deal to Abraham, the Lord's presence. But in these few verses, consider with me what a faithful, how a faithful servant practices friendliness. And I want us to consider that three ways, with hospitality, humility, and with honor. 
honoring the Lord. First word, hospitality. If you'll notice in verse 2, it says, he ran. Verse 6, it said, quick. Verse 6, quickly. Verse 7, he ran. Verse 7, he went quickly. I, I, I think the author's trying to tell us something, don't you? That when God appeared to Abraham, he got in a hurry to take care of the Lord. This is something to do quick. This is something to do expediently. There's an urgency here on behalf of Abraham, and he told his, his wife, and he had his servants do these things, and all of a sudden, God appears, and Abraham says, let's get some water to wash the feet. Get them some bread. Let's slaughter a calf. Let's get some milk. He went above and beyond uh, in hospitality to take care of his guests. Why? Because faith in God should lead to hospitality and friendliness, church. This should be an example for us of how we should interact with other people. So hospitality, secondly, uh, humility. Abraham calls himself a servant two times in this text. If you are a child of God, you are a servant of God. Even so, we are not only servants of God, we should serve others. Have you ever heard something called servant leadership? If you are a leader, one of your great tasks is to be servants of those whom you are leadership with. And I, I want to ask you a question. What do you think unbelievers think when we practice hospitality and humility? People who don't know Jesus, people who don't go to church, what do they think of Christians when we do these things? Now, I, 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 do, I do want to clarify something. When we are friendly with the world and we have hospitality, hosp hospitality with the world, that does not mean we are friends with the world. Friendliness is not friendship. Because the Bible says friendship with the world is enmity with God. So we need to draw that distinction. We need to be friendly and kind and love the world, yet not be friends with the world. But, but what do they think when we are loving them and caring for them? Church, this matters in the eyes of a lost and dying world. This kindness and love of our neighbor loving our enemies. Consider these quotes. Quote, and if you are, are concerned about the gospel, if you are concerned about the Great Commission, consider this. The secret weapon for gospel advancement is hospitality. And you can practice it whether you live in a house, an apartment, a dorm, or a high-rise, unquote. What about this one? Quote, the world could use more ordinary Christians opening their ordinary lives so that others can see what life in light of the gospel looks like, unquote. You see, our hospitality and service of others opens the door for gospel proclamation. Although service is not the gospel, it opens the door that the gospel may be proclaimed because the gospel must be preached. If we love them, if we feed them, if we care for them, it may seem mean meaningless, but these things matter because the gospel is being engaged with lost people. When we read this story, when, when we, we give food out, and we'll be giving food out this Saturday, a thousand meals, you may say, we're just handing out food. We are engaging people on behalf of Jesus Christ so that the doors may be open that they can hear the good news that they can have salvation through the Lord. You see, God not only wants us to be hospitable, 
But hasn't God been hospitable to us too? It's been said, quote, throughout the saga of history, God consistently initiates relationship. He is a gracious host, constantly welcoming in wayward sinners who deserves his wrath, a people whose only hope is that he would show them undeserved hospitality. And any time we practice hospitality, we follow in the steps of our lavishly hospitable God. So if you want to be like Jesus, if you want to be like God, be our serving leader. Hospitality in our homes, in our community, and especially here as a church, we need to be a welcoming church. And I do want to say this. Thank you so much for being a welcoming church, because you are. So hospitality, humility, and lastly, honor. When we do this, this is a good thing. This is being a good Samaritan to our neighbor, but what's more? Wasn't Abraham called a friend of God, church? We often forget that, don't we? Isaiah 41 says, God says himself, Abraham, my friend. James 2.23, Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness and he was called a friend of God. And what about us? What about the words of Jesus to his disciples in John chapter 15, verse 13? Greater love no one has than this, than someone laying down his life for his friends. And he says, you are my friends if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends, for, for all that I have heard from my father have been made known to you. Jesus tells us that the Christian is the friend of God. This is glorious. Glorious. We who were at enmity with God, separated with God, are now his friends. I'm a friend of God. He calls me friend. But if you are here this morning and you are not saved, the salvation of God, the forgiveness God of God, and the friendship of God is available to you, but you must trust in Jesus. Place your faith in Him. Next, a faithful servant is one who remembers God's promises. Verse 9, they, they said to him, where is your wife Sarah? And he said, she is in the tent. And the Lord said, I will surely return to you about this time next year. And Sarah, your, your wife, shall have a son. And Sarah was listening at the tent behind him. So once again, God reminds Abraham of this covenant, of this promise. Reminding him, and it seems like, over and over. I mean, we've talked about this a lot, haven't we? Chapter 12, he tells him. Chapter 13. Chapter 15. Chapter 16. Chapter 17. God reminds Abraham over and over again of his promise to him. I, I don't know why. Maybe Abraham was stubborn. But I tell you, often I'm the same way. Often it takes multiple times for God to tell me to do something before I even do or, or, or am obedient to him. Maybe you're like that. Parents, maybe you have some kids like that. You have one child, you tell them to do it one time. You have another child, you must tell them to do it over and over and over again. Abraham had to be reminded. Maybe there's someone here this morning. You need to be reminded of the promises of God or reminded of God's calling on your life. What has God called you to do? And what God has called you to do, he will equip you to do. And what God has called you to do, he will provide the means. And what God calls us to do, he will give us the strength to do it. Why? So that he receives all the glory. 
if he strengthens us, if he equips us, if he gives us the gifts, and he provides us everything we need, there, there is no boasting in what we do for God. There was no boasting in this for Abraham because it was all of the Lord. This is a miracle that's going to happen. But Abraham had to be reminded over and over again. Now, when I was called to preach, I, I remember questioning God. 2014, which would have been around February or so. Uh, are you sure, God? That's my question. Uh, I don't know if that's what God wants me to do. Me, God, I, I can't pastor a church. And over and over again, I would question God who was telling me and calling me to do something. And it took over and over and over again until we came to the, I came to the end of my rope and I finally said, okay, Lord, here I am. Send me. A faithful servant is one who remembers God's promises. Dio Moody says this, God will never, God has never made a promise that was too good to be true. Isn't that good? God has never made a promise that is too good to be true. Lastly, we'll notice that a faithful servant is one who trusts God's faithfulness. Verse 11, now Abraham and Sarah, they were old and advanced in years, though the way of women had ceased to be with Sarah. So Sarah laughed to herself, saying, after I am worn out and my Lord is old, shall I have pleasure? The Lord said to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh and say, shall I indeed bear a child? Now that I am old, is anything too hard for the Lord at the appointed time? I will return to you about this time next year, and Sarah shall have a son. But Sarah denied it, saying, I did not laugh, for she was afraid. And he said, no, but you did laugh. What's, what we see here. What God is saying he is going to do, it appears to be impossible. And in human terms, this is impossible. Men 99 years old, women 90 years old, it says in the text that it ceased where Sarah could bear children. People of that age, they can't have kids. It's impossible. Physically, they are unable to do it. There is nothing that the medical world can do to make these things happen. And Sarah heard this, and she laughs in disbelief. And God confronts her for this disbelief, and what does she do? She lies, saying that she didn't laugh. You see, when we think about the things of God with a human perspective, we will doubt. When we think about the things of God through God's eyes, we can have great faith. We need to look at things through the lens of the scriptures, and that's faith. Do you remember in John 6, when Jesus fed the 5,000? He asked Philip, where are you going to go buy bread? that these may eat? That sounds impossible, right? And it was. In human terms, through the eyes of humanity, feeding 5,000 people, it's impossible. And in reality, how many were there? Women, children, probably 20,000, 25,000. But the disciples looked at the situation with a human perspective, and they and their they told Jesus, we just need to send them away so that they can get their own food. But Jesus had other plans, doesn't he? I'm so glad that Jesus doesn't do things for me according to my plans, but according to his plans. What should have Philip and the disciples do? They should have said this, what, what God said in, in Genesis 18, 14. Is anything too hard for God? And I ask you that, is anything too hard for God? No. Isn't that what, G what the angel told um, Mary in Luke 137? 
nothing is impossible with God. No, nothing is impossible. Church, there is no prayer too hard for the Lord to answer. There is no problem too hard for the Lord to solve. There is no sin too great the Lord can forgive. There is no relationship too broken that our God cannot restore. And there is no sinner too lost that our Lord cannot save. Oh, surely we need to remember these things. Surely we need to have this faith that there is nothing, no nothing too hard for the Lord. Oh, that we would remember and not doubt like Sarah, but be a faithful servant of Jesus Christ. We are God's people. You could say we're ordinary people, living in an ordinary world. This world is lost. It is dying. But God has called us to something greater than a normal way of life. He, he's called us to something extraordinary. And I've shared this before. Do you want to have an extraordinary life? How about an extraordinary prayer life? You know what you need to do? Whatever you normally pray, pray more. That's more than the ordinary, right? If you want to give, give more. If you want to serve, serve more. Let's, let's do things different for once. Do things according to God and his word. Loving a world through hospitality, through service. Remembering God and his faithfulness. Remembering his promises. And surely he will do great things in our lives and, and in the life of our church. Abraham said, do not pass me by. Doesn't that remind you of the, the old hymn? Pass me not, O gentle Savior. Hear my humble cry while on others thou art calling. Do not pass me by. Savior, Savior, hear my humble cry while on others thou art calling. Do not pass me Beloved, turn to the Lord this morning. No matter what it is, our God is for you. And if he is for us, who can be against us? Turn to Jesus. He is a gentle Savior who hears our humble cry. Let's pray.